I'm delighted to present Cameron Nime, who's going to give the first of these two talks. Thanks. Hi, everyone. So I'm going to set a timer for myself so I don't go over. Um, so my name is Cameron Naim. I am uh, the head of Open Science at the European Organization for Nuclear Research. And um, I'm here to talk to you about uh, our um, disciplinary open access initiative, which has transitioned and sustained 90% of the literature um, in high energy physics uh, to, um, to full open access um, now for 10 years. So um, what is scope three? Um, it's the sponsoring consortium for open access publishing and particle physics. Um, its mission is to enable open access publishing um, by helping to remove financial and administrative barriers to science. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, as we go through the talk. It's an in, a truly international collaboration. Um, at CERN, our experimental collaborations um, consist of uh, researchers and institutions from over 100 countries. And um, Scope 3 was designed to essentially mimic the way that the collaborations work where um, CERN acts as the host organization of the host lab, um, and we facilitate uh, collective action um, in, on the research side through our research collaborations and through Scope 3 um, to deliver um, literature in our discipline as a global public good. The partnership currently consists of over 3,000 libraries, um, research institutions, and um, uh, international organizations um, from over 45 countries and growing. We hope to, in the next few months, add another four countries into the Scope 3 collaboration. And through this um, program, we have uh, effectively transitioned the research in high energy physics across 11 leading journals in the discipline uh, to full OA. So um, I just want to uh, take you back to kind of the origins of Scope 3 um, where it came from. Now, CERN as an organization has had openness effectively embedded into its activities from its very founding. So the CERN convention mentions how the research results of the lab should be made publicly available. So we see that as a strong mandate to make the research in our discipline open. Robert Amar, who was the uh, CERN DG at the time that Scope 3 was, was launched, um, he and others, other visionary um, folks within CERN um, and uh, working with um, labs like, uh, organizations like Max Planck and, um, and partners in the UC, essentially saw an opportunity to not only um, deliver open access to the research produced at CERN, but to actually take a disciplinary, disciplinary wide approach and see if we could achieve global open access um, across high energy physics. So Robert Amar um, mentioned how a global transition of the scholarly publishing model was needed and CERN was the only institution in our field to initiate such a change. Um, there's a full interview with him on YouTube, it's actually quite interesting. Um, please uh, feel free to um, check it out. Now, the original operational model of Scope 3 was premised on the idea that libraries around the world should essentially um, divest their money in subscriptions um, to the leading journals in high energy physics, take that subscription money, place it into a central fund at CERN, and then we would pay publishers directly um, for open access publishing services. So the, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about kind of the downsides of this, of this uh, model and approach. Um, there was a working party um, established in 2006. They published their report in 2007. And if you see how long it took to build consensus across the international library community, um, about five years um, of one person in particular, uh, Salvatore Mele, who uh, many of you may have met, um, five years of his life traveling around the world, talking to libraries, trying to get them to get on board with this model. Um, and 
Finally, a market survey and competitive tender was launched in 2012 um, with uh, Scope 3's operations beginning in 2014. So how does it work? Um, we've evolved the uh, contribution model away from um, being about subscription savings. And now, essentially, partners contribute to, phase, uh, to Scope 3 based on their share of the published li literature. So what we do is we have contractual phases, which are typically three years long. The last phase was five years extended for two years um, due to the uncertainty um, around COVID. We look at, so prior to the beginning of each contractual phase, we look at the entire literature in the discipline over a two year period. So that um, tends to be about 14,000 articles. And we look at every single one of those 14,000 articles. We look at where the authors come from. We um, look at their primary affiliation and we assign a fraction of those articles based on the number of authors in that paper to a country. We then add up all of the fractions at the country level. Once we have that, we have a proportional share of, um, of partners' use of the Scope 3 journals as a publishing outlet. And we then multiply that proportion by the total budget for Scope 3, which gives us what we call the fair share. So partners contribute uh, to Scope 3 based on their share of the published literature to a central fund managed by CERN. We enter into, into contractual relationships with publishers and require that all research articles be fully open access with CC BY licenses. That means there, so all the research is published away and also there are no publication costs or APCs for any authors worldwide. So I've just talked a little bit already about how um, the fraction of authorship is calculated. Um, another thing that we do is that we, um, in the case where there are, um, an author may have multiple affiliations. If one of the affiliations is CERN, we assign the fraction to CERN. If another affiliation is a lab, it goes to that HEP lab. And if they're across multiple countries, we assign the fraction to the country with the highest GDP, um, as in the example below. Um, so Pavarotti goes to Italy, Mozart, who may have an affiliation with Greece and Austria, goes to Austria, and Gershwin, who may have um, a fraction, uh, an affiliation with, with an institution in the US and with CERN, is assigned automatically to CERN. We then also ask all of our, the Scope 3 partners to add an additional 10% um, of their fair share to cover um, the uh, publishing costs associated with um, authors from countries that cannot be reasonably, reasonably expected to contribute. So we have you know, authors from over 100 countries publishing in the Scope 3 journals, um, but only 45 countries participating. We work on a collective governance model. So um, again, CERN is only the host organization. Um, Scope 3 is actually run by um, the uh, consortium members. Um, we have um, an executive committee um, that meets every two weeks, that decides strategy, um, and effectively the CERN's job is to execute um, the strategy. And all um, strategic initiatives are run by uh, members selected from Scope 3's governance. So um, this map uh, essentially shows you uh, the countries that are partners in the Scope 3 collaboration. So it's pretty global. Um, uh, in relatively um, diverse set of countries. And um, the countries in bluish purple, I guess, um, are the ones uh, that are beneficiaries um, in the Scope 3 collaboration. Now, um, one of the important things to note is that um, these 45 partners have um, contributed towards making um, the literature entirely open, um, but there are some key countries that are missing that are part of the, um, that publish um, in the Scope 3 journals who we would like to have on board. Um, hopefully we'll be looking to onboard some of them soon, but um, some of the main uh, publishing countries that do not currently participate um, are Brazil, India, and 
um, Russia, um, which obviously, for political reasons, uh, we cannot engage with at the moment. In the first 10 years, 62,000 articles were published, were published open access, fully supported by Scope 3, and um, that consists of over 90% of all of the literature in the field of high energy physics. Um, we determined that by um, looking at the archive categories in which preprints um, appear and are then um, tagged as they go to publishers. So we have a pretty diverse set of um, partners that are in Scope 3. We have um, societies, scientific societies. Um, the American Physical Society um, is uh, one of the most uh, prominent and um, popular um, publishers in our discipline. Um, we have uh, the Japanese Physical Society that's published um, through Oxford University Press, so University Press involved. Um, uh, CISA, which is an Italian scientific society um, whose journal is published through Springer, and the Europe European Physical Society whose journal um, uh, EPJC is also published via Springer. So we have um, Born Away with Hindawi, we have large commercial publishers, Elsevier and Springer, um, we have journals from scientific societies um, and university presses, so a pretty diverse set of journals covering um, the range of um, publisher types. The uh, effective cost per article, if you look at the number of articles and then the total budget um, that we have spent in Scope 3, uh, we are at about 1,200 euros per paper um, as a total investment over the last 10 years. And if you compare that to some of the list price APCs of comparable journals, you can see that we're at about a fraction of, um, of what publishers charge um, for APCs um, across um, similar titles and actually some of the same titles that are in scope three for, for non-high-energy um, physics content. And our contractual model, because we enter into multi-year contracts, um, in which we keep prices stable, um, we have managed over the last decade um, to only have to increase the budget for scope three by 7%. Now, if you compare that to what a 3% uh, um, annual price increase would look like, that's about 38% over this period of time. Um, an annual price increase of 4% would take you at 54%. Um, we believe that this um, contractual structure um, has given not only um, stability for the partnership, um, but also has um, uh, resulted in uh, excellent value for money for our community. Now, um, we're a decade in. What do we do now? Um, I think we can say, safely say that we have been able to achieve and sustain open access for energy physics now for 10 years, um, but what do we do now? So we are um, working on a mechanism to incentivize publishers to help situate the research publications in our discipline for an open science future. And so in the next phase of uh, scope three, which will begin um, in January of next year, we are incentivi incentivizing all of the publishers to deliver on certain open science elements. So I'm not gonna go through all of them, um, but effectively what we will do is we'll offer up to an additional 15% um, um, of uh, a publisher's contractual value um, based on their delivery of, um, of some of these elements. So improving accessibility um, is a, a key value. Um, we'd like to see increased uh, linking of data sets um, in papers. We want publishers to offer um, open peer review, um, to integrate ORCID um, submission into the publication process as well as ROAR adoption. And we have, uh, so we're also looking at software linking um, alongside data and providing enriched article metadata in a consistent um, standardized form um, that would go to Crossref and then hopefully benefit not only Scope 3 in our repository, but, um, but uh, metadata for um, libraries around the world. The Scope 3 community values disclosures are um, 
an element that um, we thought was uh, really important to include. These aren't going to be measured. All we're asking publishers to do is to make disclosures of their practices on some of our community values, which include um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, what they're doing around sustainability, their work around data privacy, financial transparency, um, referee recognition and compensation, and publication transparency. So looking at things like acceptance rates and desk rejection rates. Now, one of the um, messages that I got from Mark was, you know, we don't only want to hear about what makes Scopes Scope be so great. Um, like, think about, you know, what are the, some of the downsides or unintended consequences? So I think as you saw, building the collaboration um, at that time, especially when, um, you know, maybe the whole world hadn't really caught on to the value of open access. I'm not sure it has yet now either. Um, but the organizing costs of the collective, um, particularly um, working with countries and communities who may not have been as advanced in their thinking around open access as some European countries were at the time, it took a lot of effort um, and investment. And so why hasn't Scope 3 been replicated? Because it seems that, uh, as Robert Amar had mentioned, CERN was you know, the only real institution to step up. Um, it doesn't seem like any other institution representing other disciplines has chosen to take that um, that kind of a role and organize a global collective for, for open access and other disciplines. Now, um, I think another potential downside is that we've made it so easy for authors to publish their work openly um, because not only have we made everything freely available, we've also eliminated all APCs. So um, I think we can fairly say that, you know, this this ease of publication has really led to it being quite challenging for other outlets to emerge in our discipline. I think one of the interesting things that we're seeing is that, you know, one of the new outlets that is becoming um, increasingly uh, popular in energy physics is, um, is Cypost Physics, um, which also doesn't charge um, APCs to authors. So um, maybe we have kind of shifted the paradigm for publishing in our discipline and and made it more challenging for other journals to emerge. Now, the question <laughs> that um, I return to every now and then when I'm having kind of an existential crisis um, is like, do we even need scope three? Um, and, you know, I think the, the reality is, is that we have had a preprint culture in our discipline since uh, forever. Um, made online and pioneered archive. Much of the researchers in high energy physics um, read papers initially in the archive. So is scope three even needed? And I think the answer to that question, at least for me for right now, is that as long as um, researchers are evaluated on the basis of um, articles that they publish in prominent journals that convey um, reputation. Um, we would like to continue to support them and their needs in wanting their research work and the final published version to be made um, open access. But maybe that will change over time. So um, that's it for me and right on time, I believe. Um, we can go to the next talk. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, sure. Why not? Happy to take any questions that anyone may have. <laughs> sure. That was just super clear. So now I'd like to introduce Anna Heredia, who is going to join us virtually. So could we pull her 
up on the screen with his slide, please. Anna, can you hear us okay? Yes, I can. Should I put Great. the camera Thank on you. or leave it like this? <clears throat> okay, you can get started. Okay, so no camera, right? No, I can use the camera. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, okay, can you see me? Yes, we can see you now. Uh, okay, so I, um, I'm starting, um, uh, you were passing through the slides, right? Okay, so um, good afternoon or good morning everyone. I am um, joining you today from Rio de Janeiro, uh, but I would love to be with you. Um, so I'm going, my name is Ana Heredia. I am um, an independent consultant and uh, for the last 15, 20 years, I've been working in the scholarly publishing um, field at Elsevier and Orchid, um, uh, principally. And uh, I'm here today to talk uh, a little bit about the diamond open access uh, in my region, in Latin America, and some of the challenges that, um, that the organizations here in the region are facing um, regarding a sustainable publishing model. Uh, Next slide, please. So I would like to start uh, stating the importance uh, of non-mainstream journals. Um, what are the compelling reasons for researchers to publish in non-mainstream journals? Right, this paper here that you can see the results of uh, um, uh, states three main reasons. First of all, the training reason, the training function is the usage of non-mainstream journals to transit, as a transit station to publishing mainstream journals. So they may serve um, as uh, early career researchers as, um, as a training uh, to and later on publishing mainstream journals. Uh, they are used to introduce PhD students to academic publishing in their own language and then also teach them to uh, conduct relevant literature research. They also have another uh, important role, which is the knowledge bridging, um, as the non-mainstream journals uh, can, can uh, work as a link between the international research community and local communities. They um, provide, these journals provide uh, additional material for teaching, they make available open access papers that incorporate bibliographic references from sus subscribed journals. They disseminate knowledge written in English, in the case in Latin America, to Spanish and Portuguese speakers. They serve as a vehicle of uh, introducing concepts, methods, and then um, it overlaps with gap filling, which is the next important um, uh, or compelling reason for researchers to publish in non-mainstream journals. So, the gap filling function is um, allows publications of new knowledge on subjects underrepresented in mainstream uh, mainstream journals. Um, so original research, which are uh, original uh, neglected from mainstream journals, find their space in um, in non-mainstream journals and local journals. Another important uh, aspect of this is that. Uh, very frequently in low and middle income countries, uh, the research evaluation policy does do not consider uh, and high standards of uh, non-mainstream journals. So this recognition of these journals can motivate the production of research with potential to address social and envir environmental, environmental demands. So uh, next one, please. So the next slides um, uh, characterize a little bit of, uh, of the Latin American um, uh, ecosystem, let's say like this. So what, what you can see here in these slides uh, is the results of a survey carried out by the recently created Latin American Association of Scientific Editors. Um, this survey was carried out in 2021 with more than 350 um, editors of the region from 14 countries. So we consider, I, I was part of this effort and we consider this is a very 
good um, um, sample of what is going on in the region. So according to this uh, survey, you can see that the uh, majority, so the, 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 the production in the region is academic and public, as uh, the majority of the papers are produced in, in universities, in public institutions, and they target researchers, academics, and students. The majority of the uh, papers produced in the region are diamond open access, as 91% of the, of the journals are open access, and 88% of them don't charge any APC. These journals also are regionally indexed, meaning that 80% of the journals of the Latin American region are not indexed in Web of Science or Scopus, as you can see uh, in the graph below, right? And 90% of the journals uh, of the region don't have an impact factor. So you can see that 60, in the graph, you can see that 68% of the journals are indexed in uh, Doage, and then in the local, um, uh, in the regional uh, indexing databases, like Lactindex, Redalic, and Cielo, and that's 15 to 17% only of the, um, of the uh, uh, papers of the journals are present in Scopus of Web of Science. So um, these results clearly show that uh, in the region, uh, knowledge is considered as a common good produced in public universities with public funds. And this is what we see in these results. Um, another important thing is that the science that is not seen is not reused and is not cited, right? So next slide. Um, we'll show the, uh, the results of two uh, papers. So, yeah. So the first uh, graph you can see there is, uh, no, please, just the, the, the left one. Thank you. So uh, there you can see the participation of universities in the scientific production. These are not very um, recent data. These are uh, uh, 2015 data. But what is interesting to see is that you see that Latin America um, is, uh, has 70% of their output of their production uh, produced in the universities, right? So you can see first Chile, Colombia, Brazil, Portugal, Latin America uh, as a whole. Uh, then you have uh, Spain. And, and then you have like a, a, a decreasing in the participation of universities in the scholarly output. The number you can see in Argentina, which is quite strange to see it away from the country uh, uh, in another block of, 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 of uh, countries, um, or not together with Mexico and, and Brazil, is that in, in Argentina you have um, an affiliation problem that uh, uh, very often researchers put their affiliations in publications as, be, as being the, fund, the national funding agency, which is CONICET or the, the, the um, yeah. And then they don't put the university they belong to as the affiliation. So this creates a discrepancy um, in, the, in the data we can see sometimes. So uh, on the right, uh, the next, uh, uh, yes, graph you can see uh, the global di distribution of o OAD journals according to APC or Diamond. So in green, so you can see the regions. So each bar is a region of the world. You can see uh, Latin America, which is the, the bar, uh, the, the, the biggest green bar, uh, which are um, Diamond uh, journals, Diamond Open Access journals, and in yellow are the APC-based journals. So you can see the Latin America is the region of the world where um, the diamond open access model has been the, the more uh, adopted, is the more used, uh, it's, it's, it's almost a, a standard, right, in the region. Uh, next slide, please. So continue to characterize the, um, the Latin America uh, publishing ecosystem. Here you can see three key, key players. They are not the only ones, but they're the, uh, the most important ones. Uh, three key players in the region that uh, have a, a, a key role in, in the infrastructure uh, uh, of open access uh, in the region. So, <coughs> 
I will start with Redalic and Cielo that you probably heard of. Um, Redalic and Cielo are two indexing databases, two full text open access um, collections of journals. Um, and you can see uh, that uh, Redalic represents uh, publications of 31 countries, uh, almost 800 uh, publishing institutions, 1.6 K Diamond open access journals, and more than uh, 800 uh, K full text articles. The numbers of CL are a little bit um, uh, old, so I will tell the, the, the right numbers uh, orally. So CL is a network of 17 countries. Um, they, uh, today they have almost two, um, uh, 2,000 open access journals and more than 1 million uh, full text articles. Um, La Referencia, which you can see in the left part of the, of the screen, is a network of institutional repositories. So the three organizations are uh, pro-open access, right? Uh, and La Referencia is a network of open access institutional repositories uh, of Latin America. So they, they harvest from the national nodes of 12 countries uh, and these nodes in the countries, they harvest from the institutions to the national node and then La Referencia harvest it uh, and connects it to OpenAIDE and COAR that are uh, like international uh, coalitions or networks of uh, uh, institutional repositories. So you can see uh, through this, these three um, infrastructures, uh, the amount of uh, journals and uh, papers we are talking about in the region. Next one, please. Regarding uh, business models, uh, publishing business models in Latin America, what you can see here in this graph is, the, um, is a study that has been made uh, putting together the, the Cielo collection and the Redalic collection. Of, of course, there is an overlap of the journals they index. And so this, this corpus of data uh, is uh, around uh, 1,720 journals in the region from 15 countries. 90% of them are uh, open access, which corroborates what we just saw, uh, saw before. 10% of them charge APCs uh, and 60% of these journals charging APCs, and we are going to see why this is happening, uh, are from Brazil, okay? Uh, nevertheless, the APCs, uh, regional, local journals charge are significantly lower than those charged by uh, big publishers, right? And also there is, uh, they um, have different fees that can be applied to students, to Brazilian researchers, etc. So uh, what you also can see that in the graph is that this study showed clearly that um, the, the, the role of the presence of commercial publishers in the region is really incipient, right? Uh, from experience, I can say that uh, Elsevier and Springer are the, the two uh, um, publishers that have uh, some, some journals here in the country, mainly um, not an expressive number of them, and mainly uh, society journals, right? So it's very clear uh, from, uh, from this graph that the majority of the, of the papers are from university uh, publishers and then some society journals. So this uh, uh, finalizes uh, characterizing uh, the publishing ecosystem here in, in my region. Um, so through this graph you can see, uh, you can infer uh, the size of the challenge that local journals have to face. Right. Um, next slide. This is to just to show to you a little bit of the intensity of the national open access actions here in Latin America. So in the right uh, uh, figure in the, in the map, you can see that the, the deeper the blue, 
uh, the more um, committed uh, this country is regarding open access at a national level. And you can see that Brazil is uh, clear, <laughs> is lighter, right? This means, and you can see in the left, that Brazil, uh, differently from the main countries of the region, which are Argentina, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, Peru, and Brazil, uh, doesn't, does, not, does not have a national open access policy or a national uh, open access legal framework, which the other country, countries do have. Uh, the, the only thing Brazil has is institutional um, uh, open access public, uh, policies. So individual institutions have their own policies. Uh, just to um, illustrate a little bit of this, uh, Peru uh, created uh, their first national uh, legal framework for uh, open access in 2013. Argentina, through different instruments, okay? In some countries, it's a law. In some, in some other countries, it's um, uh, um, a policy, a national policy or specific laws. In Argentina, it was also in 2013. In Mexico, it was in 2014. In the last one, uh, Colombia, uh, uh, built a policy, a national policy on open science in 2022. So the fact that Brazil doesn't have uh, a national uh, legal framework around open access is quite concerning because Brazil is responsible for more than or around 50% of the scientific production of uh, the region. Uh, next slide, please. Here is to illustrate that besides uh, the um, open access actions, uh, legal frameworks and infrastructure that I showed to you that is present very strong in the region, uh, there are also some associations uh, um, that um, reinforce, that corroborate, that strengthens the importance of uh, this local to this regional ecosystem. So you can see here um, that regionally, as I mentioned before, we have uh, the uh, uh, Latin American Association of Scientific Editors. Brazil has the Brazilian Association of Scientific Editors that congregates more than 130 uh, editors and journals and their journals. In Uruguay, you have uh, the network Aura that uh, uh, assembles uh, 25 editors and journals. In Argentina, uh, 4, 24 universities and research institutions are also uh, together. Uh, in Chile, 200 journals from 15 universities uh, compose the, the um, Chilean network of open access journals. And in Colombia, ACEUC uh, reunites 65 university presses. Next, please. So um, here are, this is uh, data collected from different sources uh, showing the impact uh, or the volume of APCs uh, in our country. So global studies show a total of more than a uh, billion dollars spent in, three in a three years period uh, um, in the world. But uh, there are some data around how much Argentina, Chile and Colombia are spending uh, on APCs and the, the, the amounts are not uh, small, right? Uh, given the budgets, the national budgets that that, that countries uh, have. Um, so for, for, for the community in the region, the change from reader pays to author pays simply changed the sources of funds for mainstream publishers because the origin of the funds is the same, it's public funds, right? Um, so how in this scenario, right, uh, how to measure the national impact of APCs in low and medium income countries where uh, individual researchers may pay for APCs or uh, different instruments from public uh, financing can finance this. So uh, how to measure this impact? Uh, next one, please. So Cielo, which I mentioned before and, and probably many of you heard about, 
Cielo is a network of 17 countries, and they have also Cielo data and Cielo preprint services for, uh, for uh, the journals. Uh, Cielo Brazil is the leading organization setting the standards and the criteria for the whole network. Uh, national collections are the responsibility of the institutions heading the Cielo operation uh, in the country. Uh, it can be a funding agency, ministries of education, science and technology, uh, ministries of health, public universities. So depending on the country, Cielo, the Cielo operation will be uh, led by different organizations. So the Brazil one is uh, the, the strongest one, let's say. So um, Cielo Works um, has an operational annual cost uh, of around $1.5 million. Uh, they estimate that the cost of a journal is around 6.2 uh, K and uh, a cost of $85 per article. Uh, in terms of revenues, um, the majority of the funds that uh, finance Cielo comes from FAPESP, which is the Sao Paulo State Funding Agency, which is not CAPES or CNPQ, which are the national funding agency. This is a state funding agency that finance, uh, that has Cielo as a program, as a research program, right? And every three years, uh, it has to be renewed. And this program is um, basically uh, assigned to uh, the director of Cielo Brazil uh, and uh, is linked also to the Federal University of Sao Paulo. So as you can see, it's all um, uh, public fund, okay? And 10 to 20 percent of uh, of its funds come from CNPq and CAPES, which are the national funding agencies. So you can see that um, that uh, 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 that it, the situation of CL is quite precarious, right? And by the way, um, FAPESP announced that uh, from 2023 onwards. Uh, the budget would uh, be cut to 40%, okay? So this shows the precarity, at the same time, the strength and the importance of uh, an instrument like Cielo. But on the other hand, it shows how uh, precarious or how, uh, you know, how close the organization is to, to, uh, to have troubles, let's say like this. So currently, Cielo is supporting Golden Open Access. Uh, it is supporting journals uh, that charge what they call contributions to the publishing costs, so CCP. Um, and um, and this uh, contrasts a little bit with the following, with the next slide, which is about Redalic, right? So Redalic clearly took recently a bold step. Uh, towards uh, what they call uh, diamond open access or non-commercial global infrastructure owned by academia, right? Uh, they, uh, so Cielo just uh, had its 25th anniversary. Redalic uh, had their um, 20th anniversary, so they are very long lasting uh, uh, organizations that, that are now taking a little bit of different paths. Um, so Redalic uh, clearly is now uh, indexing exclusively journals that are not charging APCs um, and that, that shares the nonprofit publishing model uh, that they um, that they embrace, right? So we have readily, they uh, are a multidisciplinary research group hosted by, hosted and financed by the Autonomous University of the State of Mexico, which is a public university. Uh, readily is now um, under the SCOS, uh, is, is a SCOS certified project, so it is uh, uh, crowdfunding uh, money. And it also received a French fund uh, for open science, uh, and that and that are that is the way they are financed. Also, quite precarious if you think on the importance and the magnitude of the of their collections, right? So, uh, 
Regalic is now indexing, they are interested in journals that have editorial scientific quality, that they have some kind of digital publishing technology, XML jets, that have an open access policy free of APCs, and that shares this vision um, to overcome the current assessment of, of science based on metrics like the impact factor and promoting the inclusion of local science and linguistic diversity for the common good. Uh, next one, please. So, on the other hand, uh, large publishers are also acting in the regional, pro in the regional uh, scenario, approaching the large consortia, especially Colombia and Brazil, with whom they have had long-term commercial relationships due to the national subscription agreements that are predominant in the region. So CAPES, as I mentioned before, is one of the two national funding agencies in Brazil. They are responsible for the national consortium that provides access to more than 50K of uh, text journals and to more than 400 institutions in Brazil. And, it's, uh, and, and this portal is considered to be one of the most important instruments to reduce asymmetries in the country. So CAP is leading, is currently leading the discussions around transformative agreements and has recently organized a collaborative workshop on open access and transformative agreements, where key uh, stakeholders, including universities, uh, vice chancellors of research, were invited. So the aim of this workshop was to inform and listen to the community around these things and prepare the ground for uh, transformative agreements as, as a way to channel the funds towards open access publications in the subscribed journals from the big international publishers. So the journals they are already subscribing. So you can see here, uh, which is uh, a paradox, so like, uh, you, so CAPES, the country has a hundred million dollars budget to put into subscriptions and transformative agreements, but journals, local journals only receive a maximum of 20K to run their operations per journal per year, right? In the, in the best scenarios. So there is there a tension and discrepancy uh, where you clearly see the local journals uh, struggle a lot to survive uh, in this scenario. So to finish uh, my talk, next slide, please. Uh, some tensions and challenges from what I just uh, told you, right? So the traditional publishing model in the region is diamond, but paradoxically, the local journals don't receive enough, enough support from their universities or from funding agencies. Non-mainstream journals are not highly considered in national evaluation systems. Redelic is taking a step further, only indexes non-APC open access journals. CL is supporting gold open access for local journals, which struggle to survive. Brazil and Colombia are moving towards transformative agreements at a national level, uh, although the, the community is not very open to it, so uh, a little work is needed there. There is not enough institutional and national incentives to publish in open access, uh, either mainstream journals or local journals. And local key organizations like Alaec and Redalic are publishing manifestos to strengthen local journals as a, me a mean of having a more diverse and inclusive and truly global scholarly publishing ecosystem. So just to wrap up, although Brazil and Colombia initiatives to make sure the publications of their researchers are, are uh, available in open access mainstream journals, we cannot forget that 50% of the regional scientific output uh, in the region is, is published in non-mainstream journals who are struggling uh, with uh, under precarious funding conditions. So, and they play uh, a very important role in the regional scholarly communication ecosystem through the training of early careers researchers, knowledge bridging and knowledge filling. So, Next slide, please. Thank you very much. Uh, and I am happy to uh, have your comments, questions.
questions. So any questions for either Cameron or for Anna? While we get the microphone sorted out, I have one for uh, Cameron. I'm going to pass the microphone over to you. So what do you think has stopped other large organizations like CERN from doing something similar? A lack of vision, maybe. Um, well, I, you know, I, I think that um, maybe one of the things that uh, CERN um, demonstrated, because I guess we, we were kind of considered the first transformative arrangement, and then um, we, uh, I think, helped to inspire um, initiatives like OAT 2020. Um, you know, I think the um, the reality is is that uh, so much of scholarly publishing is controlled by um, by large commercial publishers um, who uh, initiated uh, transformative arrangement strategies um, over the last few years and gave institutions pathways to make their their authors' content open. Um, that kind of you know obviated the need for another organization to step in, um, in the kind of way that, that CERN did in, in high energy physics. Any other questions? I have one for Anna. So Anna, do you think uh, either um, Cielo or, or Redilic could offer a, um, a, a model for um, Coalition S as they move uh, beyond the APC? Yeah, I think Redelic is uh, talking very closely to uh, to uh, coalition. As I think uh, Redelic, I couldn't uh, show it, but they, they have a model. Uh, they have um, they have even uh, data showing how their model um, because they provide infrastructure, they provide service to services to the editors. So as well as Cielo, uh, but they, um, uh, they clearly have their model, which they are um, reinforcing and showing the world. So yeah, I invite you to get more information on that, but they are, they are involved uh, with discussions in, uh, with Plan S and uh, clearly their, um, their model is being um, studied and, um, and uh, looked uh, closer. Yeah, they have a model that uh, clearly um, uh, the, the cost of producing an article is clearly uh, cheaper than what um, the, what is showed by big publishers. So, yeah, they, they for sure. Thank you. Any other questions? This one just down there. Hi everyone. Oh, sorry, that was loud. <laughs> My name is Ursula. I'm from the Open Access Book Usage Data Trust effort. And I have a question for both, actually. Uh, for Cameron, I know that this model also applies to books, if I'm not mistaken. So can you tell us a little bit how does it work? Does it, did you have the same type of results or feedback? And for Anna, I was also wondering from your research that you did in Latin America, did you find any information about those uh, models for books, like open access books? Or is there any information on that? Thank you. Okay, uh, I'll go first. Yes, so we do have a books initiative. Um, it started off in 2021, um, where a um, working group of Scope 3 consortium members identified a list of the most popular titles in our discipline, so backlist titles, and then we entered into negotiations with the publishers to try and see if we could uh, get them to flip those books to open. Um, I'll say that we weren't super successful with that list because um, the list had a lot of really prominent textbooks on it, and um, actually one of the publishers said that one of the textbooks made so much money, they were embarrassed to even tell us how much we would have to pay them to replace the revenue that they made on it. So um, we, uh, we did convert about 80 um, titles in that first round, 
And um, now what we're doing is instead of trying to um, kind of enter into these discussions where we're like replacing um, revenue that, that, that uh, books made, we are now um, asking publishers to um, give us quotes for books that are in the pipeline um, to be published so that we can make them um, born away. So basically we pay them a BPC. Um, the contribution model for that is entirely voluntary. So um, we just ask Scope 3 uh, consortium members to pay whatever they can. And I can tell you that, you know, we have, uh, each year we kind of like make a ballpark estimate of how much money we need. And usually the consortium either doubles or triples that target. Um, so actually this year we're probably going to be able to fund all the books without having to ask for extra money because we have a good surplus. Um, but the books are all available through the OAPEN library um, and uh, through the Scope 3 collection and the OAPEN library is now also being hosted by CERN. So. Thank you, Anna. And uh, books in Latin America? Yeah. So Cielo, uh, besides the national uh, collections, they also have uh, all the collections, like for example, uh, Cielo uh, books, or for example, uh, I don't know, other other collections. But uh, Cielo books uh, uh, now has more than a thousand, one point two thousand uh, uh, titles in open access. Uh, and um, so they have a specific collection of books with more than 120 million downloads. So yeah, Cielo is, uh, is uh, working on that. Thank you. I think we are right on lunchtime now and I never want to be between a large room of people and their lunch. So thank you very much to Cameron and to Anna for excellent presentations. And lunchtime is downstairs and don't forget the lightning talks.